Together and every.
precious lamb, heaven's bridegroom, my dearest one, son of God, son of man, my beloved friend, my heart is longing for longing for my love. Come, Lord Jesus, come. The Spirit and the bride say, come. The root of Jesse, eternal.
Thank you, wonderful Father, for answering our desperate plea this morning for you to come. We need you. We'll never cease to need you. You're the center of it all. Hallelujah. And we exalt your magnificent presence. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Move in us and through us. Stir our hearts for you. We've come to encounter you, mighty one. Have your way in our hearts. Come on, just continue to meditate on his face. Have your way in our hearts. Hallelujah. 
The Lord highlighted a few people to me, and I pray that I will give the word as he has intended. Jacob, the Lord says he has not changed his mind about you and that you are a gatekeeper for your family. And I believe that you are aware of the call, sometimes the call, Jacob Cortez. Cortez, you are aware of the call, but the call is frightening at times. But he's just saying, I will walk you through it. He's embracing you through it. And although sometimes that role may get a little lonely, he's just encouraging you that your obedience is better than any sacrifice that you could ever give up. So can I just hug you? I'm not going to knock you down this time. Just come. Great purpose for you. Be encouraged. And then is Summer Calhoun here? So I heard the Lord say it's summertime. It's summertime. And he began to show me the seeds that you have poured into all of your family. And sometimes you feel like, where is the return? When will the season finally come so that I can enjoy the fullness of what I have labored for, what I have planted? And God says, now is the time. And I also saw your family embracing you, whereas you are the mother hen that's always hovering. You're always covering. I saw you in the center, and I saw your husband tightly embracing you, and then I saw your three children over you. And they are the reward. They are the reward. So the labor that you have so diligently sown, the reward is them. And then from there, it will continue to spread. Your evangelistic call is heightening. Thank you, Lord. You've put your family first as your first love and as your first mission. And so now God is entrusting with you through the Pregnancy Health Center more missions, more people who are becoming into the house through you. And he is going to give you the words to say because you are ministering to a very unique group of people that can relate to your love and your warmth and your acceptance and the truth that you will share. So I just thank you, wonderful God, for the evangelistic call on Summer's life. Thank you, God. Thank you for the fruit of her labor. And children, will you go just embrace your mom for me? Just the three of you, go hug her tightly. She's invested in you all. Now you just love on her. Is Brad here? Okay, tell him when I get home, I'll tell him to give you a bear hug. That's what I saw in the vision. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. And then Patrick and Lauren, where are you? Okay. So over your head is a sweet baby, as the Lord gave me a few weeks ago, but something related to fear is in the way. So you all have got to release the fear, the trepidation of being parents of a child that you birthed. I know you're a parent to an adoptive child, but you feel like this is different territory. And I see in the spirit where this baby is just like circling and waiting, but you all have to remove the fear. And so this baby can come forth and do the purpose that this baby is called to do. So, Lord, I thank you right now. Matter of fact, Lauren, just come. Just come quickly. Let me just touch your head. Thank you, Lord. I just thank you, God, that all the fear, it leaves right now. All the reservations, they leave right now. God says, you are able, you are adequate. You can do this. Your body, it was made for this. You can carry a child. You can nurture a child. You can birth a child. No part of the process is um, unattainable. No part of it should frighten you. Take my hand, says the Lord, and I will walk you through it, and it will be joyous. Father, I thank you for an eventless pregnancy. I thank you that it will 
not come with complications. In the name of Jesus, anoint her womb right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this seed. Thank you for this seed. I thank you they will govern this child in the ways of righteousness and holiness. For your name's sake, thank you for this inheritance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, my dear. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, wonderful Jesus. And the very last person was Casey. Am I pronouncing your name right? Okay, then why are you looking like I'm not saying it right? You can stay right there. Um, I just see the Lord with this gigantic eraser. And he's erasing the labels that people have put on you. Even from a child, I see you at your desk and your head is low and people are constantly saying this and that and you have believed it. You have embraced it as truth, but he is coming and he's saying no more. I give you identity in me and I want you to embrace that. You are valuable. You are worthy. You are worth it. You are capable. Yes, you are. You can do anything that God has called you to do. Thank you, Jesus. Some of them were, were malicious, some were not. But in any case, it left you damaged, but he's here to repair the damage today. So I thank you, God. I thank you, God, for Casey's embracing of who she is in you. I thank you that she is fearfully and wonderfully made, and she knows it without a shadow of a doubt. It is unshakable truth to her. And I command every lying spirit over her now. Go in the name of Jesus. Leave right now in the name of Jesus. Be free. Be free. Be free. Be free. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, touch her. Holy Spirit, encompass her. Holy Spirit, overwhelm her. Free, 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 free. In the name of Jesus. Nobody touch her. The Holy Spirit is touching her. Hallelujah. He's going to those deep deaths and he's repairing the wounds. Ha, sha. And all the time you lost because of it, you will redeem the time. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God, you're so good. I love you. Bless your day. Mm. Now the word for this house. Let me move quickly. If you have not been coming to Midnight Cry, please plan to come. God meets us in a special way. We just meet once a month from midnight to three. Come and give him that sacrifice. And so I kept hearing the word resuscitation. Resuscitation. I want to resuscitate my people. And so then he took me to Luke 10, verse 30, and a few verses down. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jer Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And so I said, okay, Holy Spirit, walk me through the connection between resuscitation and this scripture. So he began to show me that this man had some life in him. Half of it had been snatched away by life. And these people who were representative of leadership in the church passed him by. And the person that was considered the outsider had compassion. He said, so you see, the leadership, I don't mind. I don't mind priesthood. But when it's devoid of kingdom, I mind it. When there is rulership without compassion, I mind it. And so he said, this is what religion does. It leaves my people half dead. It leaves them half dead. So much so that a priest and a Levite could see the condition and remain and say, that's fine. It's okay. That's good enough. 
But the person who had the kingdom connection, who had love, said there's compassion that's needed. And he said, I want to resuscitate the part of you that has given way to religion that has died, that has withered, and that has been desensitized to the move of the Spirit. I want to resuscitate those parts in you. So Willow, if you will lift your hands. This is not a conditional call. This is a declarative call this morning. And I thank you, Abba God, hallelujah, for the full resuscitation in this house, hallelujah, where religion once left us half dead part of us moving part of us stagnant part of us unified part of us disunified I uh, thank you wonderful God uh, for the full resuscitation uh, back to life uh, back to life uh, back to the fullness of the spirit back to the cleric and call thank you wonderful father that you're breathing your breath your ruha breath of life within us uh, that you're reviving the priesthood and the love and the kingdom binding it back together as so you gave Adam in the beginning. I thank you, God, that we have rulership and relationship. Thank you, wonderful God, for the presence of the mighty Holy Spirit in this place. And I thank you, God, that as we breathe in and breathe out, we can feel the newness within us. We can feel the call rising within us. We can feel the stirring and the burning. And we give you glory. We give you glory, God. Thank you for this holy moment. Thank you, God, that you've come to see about your people. Oh, I thank you, God, that Willow will do everything you've called her to do. Nothing will be missing, nothing broken, nothing lacking. Thank you, Jesus, will fulfill all of the will of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, no longer half dead, says the Lord. I've resuscitated you to life and the fullness thereof. Come on, clap your hands for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Go hug a neighbor. Well, that was another awesome worship service again. You guys did such a great job. Kathleen is part of the worship team. And I'm a little biased, but I think they did great. The Spirit of God is always moving this place. Jesus is here, guys. Yes. Jesus is in this place. Yes. Uh, I think there were some technical difficulties uh, earlier that maybe we, we didn't uh, have an opportunity to show uh, earlier. But so let's start at just the top. A, just a recap. You know, we're talking about <laughs> Palm Sunday, Palm yes. Sunday, the significance of Palm Sunday. And it's really about ushering in our Savior, Jesus. And it's That's from right. Zechariah 9. It's a prophecy that was fulfilled. Uh, Jesus mm -hmm. rode in on the donkey and had a colt with him, and that's to fulfill prophecy. Uh, yes. But it is, a, uh, I, I think, an illustration of just uh, the humbleness that Christ came mm -hmm. in. He came in meek uh, and in a different way than what the Jewish people uh, expected right. him to come in. But he did come in yes. with power and just the preparation for our salvation. And so that's really important to understand. But, uh, you know, Jesus rode in on a donkey, but... The next time he comes well, in, he's coming in on a white horse. So. I love the sweet symbolism. The, the, don the donkey basically is a symbolism for humbleness, which our Lord was so humble. And then also the palm leaves were symbolic for goodness and victory. And which also surrendering. Had, yes, but he had victory mm -hmm. over the grave, and that is just a beautiful thing. Yes, yes. And like I said, the time for Jesus, guys, is right now. I mean, times are changing. Right. We Many of us believe that we are in the end times, so there's no time to wait. If you haven't given Jesus an opportunity, I encourage you to do that now. The Spirit of God moves in this place. Mm -hmm. The Spirit of God is in this place, but He's yes. also with you. The Word of God says that God is always with you and He's never going to forsake you. The time for Jesus is now. He's calling you right now. If you give Him an opportunity, you're going to see some incredible things happen in your life. I know that we speak from experience. We see it in the church, but we see it all around. And I'm expecting more and more things to happen. Yes. The power of God is, is, is in his name, as I prayed earlier. Right. I've seen it. I've experienced it. And that's what the word of God says. God's word mm -hmm. never comes back void. God's word is always powerful and always comes yeah. to pass. That's right. Well, um, 
God is just always good. This is just a beautiful Palm Sunday. I did want to go over a couple of announcements with you. Just so you know, youth camp will be coming up in a few short months, and we're actually doing a fundraiser for them. We have a giving wall um, that if you want to give to that, you can text to 81010, and it's, I believe it's Willow Youth W. Why? Yeah, it's online. Um, but you can go ahead and just text to that and let them know where you would like to, to give that. And also that we do have prayer from 6.30 to 8.30, Monday through Friday. We just did um, the midnight cry. It was very powerful. We were able to, to be there at that, and the presence of God was just beautiful. But anyway, we um, were glad to have had this time with you today. And yeah, we look forward to the message. So yes. take out your note paper and uh, stay tuned <laughs> he's just watching Oh, praise God this morning, Willow. Thank you, praise and worship team, for entering us into his presence this morning. Latoya, thank you for so much for these prophecies this morning. We're glad, we're glad that everyone has come to be in the Lord's house this morning. And we're happy for those that are worshiping with us online as well. We pray that uh, you will just receive a blessing. I know you will this morning. Uh, we'd just like to uh, welcome all the visitors that are with us this morning. And we ask if it's the first time that you visited with us and if you hadn't already filled out one of the blue cards, that you take that blue card in the pew rack in front of you and you just fill out the contact information there. And also on the back side, there's room for a prayer request or uh, any decision that you make this morning or any questions that you have, you can check that and we can get that information to you. So this is the time of our service where we worship Him in our tithes and offerings. And we know it's just as much a part of every other part of our worship this morning. So on, on the screen, you will see four ways to give either online or during the week. But if you're ready to give your tithes and offerings this morning, we'll be passing the plate. So um, we're gonna just ask the ushers if they'll come forward. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your presence this morning. Lord, we feel your spirit. Lord, even in our worship songs and the proclamations, Lord. And Lord, we know that your word is going to come forth, Lord, from our pastor. So Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds and our ears and our eyes, Lord, to hear what you say to the church. Lord, that we'd be willing, willing to be obedient to you. Lord, we thank you for this tithe that's going to be received. We pray, Lord, that you would just take it and multiply it and use it for your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, come on, somebody put your hands together for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's worthy, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're excited to be in the house of the Lord another time. Happy Palm Sunday. Yeah, this is the day the Lord has made. So we will rejoice and we are glad in it. Um, I got a few announcements. Um, 
Number one, the youth giving wall is still up in the atrium. Please grab an envelope to help us send every student to camp. They go every year to EYC and it's a big part of what is imparted to them every year. So we appreciate all of your donations. If you have envelopes out, please get those turned in. Also, um, first of all, if you are visiting here today, let me just see your hand. I'm not gonna call you out. Praise the Lord, give them a hand for being here. <laughs> Hallelujah, hallelujah. Just wanna say welcome to Willow Church and we're so happy that you've chosen to worship with us today. Know that anytime the doors of the church are open for us, they're open for you as well and come back anytime. Also this Friday, March 29th is a day for the King at Lighthouse Church. That's in Clute. Uh, Willow will be singing and worshiping the Lord from seven to 9 p.m. So if you're not doing anything Friday, join us this Friday at Lighthouse Church from seven to nine and come praise the Lord with us. And then next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. And so next, yeah, yeah. So next Sunday, we will be celebrating the risen King. And if you desire to get baptized, maybe you've just recently given your life to the Lord, or you want to rededicate your life to Jesus, um, and you desire to be baptized, you'll want to fill out the, um, your name on the, a form in the information desk, and it's outside in the atrium. So sign up for that so you can be baptized next week. And then also, we will be at the Pregnancy Help Center on April 30th from 6 to 8 p.m. doing outreach. So if you want to get connected more and serve and do outreach, the Pregnancy Help Center is an amazing mission work that we're connected to. And so for just one day, for two hours, we will be doing outreach on April 30th. If you desire to do that, sign up outside at the information desk in the atrium. Amen. All right, if you got your Bible, turn with me to Zechariah chapter 9. Going to begin reading at verse 9. And we're going to skip around today, so put a pen right there. And then head over to Matthew chapter 21, verse 9. And then also mark Matthew chapter 23, verses 37. So we're going to hop around a little bit, Zechariah 9 and 9, Matthew 21 and 9, and then Matthew 23 and 37. And then also, don't forget, immediately following this service, we will have a potluck pitch in. And so we want you to stay with us, eat with us, and fellowship with us immediately following this service. It's going to be good. Y'all ready to eat? I'm going to preach quick today. No, no, I'm lying. Let me stop already. Here I go. I'm not going to preach quick today. It's probably an hour. We'll see. All right, you guys there? All right, let's stand and read God's word, Zechariah 9 and 9, Matthew 21 and 9, Matthew 23 and 37. If you have it, say amen. If you don't have it, say hold on. Okay. All right. If you um, also, as my wife said, we had a powerful midnight cry this past weekend. It was amazing. And um, praise the God, Holy Spirit came in so strong, um, just began to speak to us and we began to seek his face. Also, don't forget, Monday through Friday from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., join us in morning prayer. It's a two-hour window. You don't have to stay for the whole two hours. Maybe you can come 30 minutes before you head to work or drop the kids off. But you want to come in for that Monday through Friday prayer, 6.30 to 8.30. And then Monday night prayer is from 6 to 7 p.m., so join us tomorrow. All right, Zechariah 9, verse 9. And it says, Rejoice greatly. Somebody say, Rejoice greatly. O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Matthew 21 and 9, it says this, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Matthew 23 verse 37. It says this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. 
See, your house is left to you desolate. Somebody say desolate. desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Spirit of the living God, do what only you can do, not by might and not by power, but by your spirit. Father, we thank you for your word. Let it be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Holy Spirit, illuminate your word. Bring it revelation. Make it revelatory to us this day. Let it come alive so that it will quicken and ignite our souls. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. And so today, for the next few moments, I'm just really going to be talking about the deeper meaning of Palm Sunday. Um, but if I had to give it a title, I would say, expect the unexpected. Somebody say, expect the unexpected. And so we've been in the last several weeks, the um, end time series, last of the last days. We're going to take a little bit of a break from that today and next week, and then we'll pick back up the following week. But we'll see some of those threads still running into this text this morning. And so when we look at Palm Sunday, I was praying and seeking the Lord, what, do you, what would he have me to say? And I said, Lord, this is like the ninth Palm Sunday sermon. I got to do something different today. And, uh, and so God just began to speak. And when we talk about expecting the unexpected, I really believe that this was a key factor in the people of God. Praise the Lord. Come on, somebody. <laughs> that devil is a liar. He's not going to win. All right. And so when we look at expecting the unexpected, I really believe that this is what really played a part in the people of God not being able to receive Jesus when he came. When we look at the definition of unexpected, definition of unexpected, it describes something that takes us by surprise. When you say I had an unexpected knock at the front door or you say I got an unexpected check in the mail. Come on. We like those types of unexpected, but we don't always like unexpected things because when it's unexpected, you don't anticipate something happening. And how many of you know we like to have control? Yeah, y'all quiet, but y'all do. Oh, let every lying demon be exposed in Jesus' name. <laughs> And so we like to have control. And so when it comes to things that catch us off guard or catch us by surprise, that is what we view as unexpected. You have no clue that it's coming. And it is un unannounced, it's unpredicted, it's out of the blue, it is unanticipated, it's unforeseen. And so when we look at that definition and we tie it to the text today of how Jesus came and he was rejected by his own people, the reason why this happened is because Jesus did not come in the way that they expected him to come. I think this is a warning to us today and we really need to take heed to it, not only as a church, but individually, that just because you are saved or just because you love God, if you are not in alignment and don't have an open heart to receive what God is doing in the moment, you will miss your time of visitation. You will miss your time of visitation, and this is clearly what has happened to the Jews. And here we are about 2,000 years later, and they still have missed that Jesus was the Messiah. I love it because when you look at Matthew chapter 23... Um, first of all, Palm Sunday is given in every single gospel um, from a slightly different stand based off of the writer. In Matthew 23, Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children as a hen gathers her brood under her wing? And you were not willing. Somebody say, you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. 
For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so this was prophesied as Jesus went through the city and they waved the palm branches before him and he was riding on the donkey. Um, If you go back to the story when Jesus told his disciples, he said, go get a donkey. It's never been ridden before. It's going to be tied up. And he says, it is next to a cult. He says, untie it and bring them to me. He says, and if anyone asks what you are doing, say the Lord has need of it. I think that is so funny because they are still in this donkey. <laughs> they are hijacking this donkey. I tell you, Jesus would be asking them to do some crazy stuff, Cornell. And he said, listen, take it. Because if it's tied up, that means it belongs to somebody. <laughs> Jesus? So he said, listen, untie the donkey. I don't care who it belongs to. And if somebody say, what you doing? You just say, the Lord needs it. And so they took it. They hijacked the donkey and it was the call. I love this because my whole life, I've preached Palm Sunday sermons, Pastor Shirley, probably nine, this is the ninth time. And I never, un, I never saw that when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem, there was a donkey and a colt. There were two beasts. You just see the pictures with him riding on one animal. There is a donkey and it is accompanied by the child. It is accompanied by the cult. And so they take the donkey, they bring it to Jesus. Jesus rides into town and the people are praising him and they are worshiping him and they are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. Somebody shout Hosanna. To do this, it literally means save now, or it means salvation has come. So many times in Jesus' ministry, um, he would heal people and he would keep his identity under wraps because it wasn't time for a convergence yet. So he didn't want people to know who he was, but in this moment, he is riding into town on a donkey. Now, number one, we talked about it last week. When Jesus comes back the second time, he's not riding on a donkey. He's going to be mounted on a white stallion. Okay, that white stallion is a sign that, number one, you are ready for war and that you are coming out with the victory. Somebody say, I'm coming out with the victory. Okay, so this time he's riding on a donkey um, or a colt, um, and this is a symbolic of peace and humility. So this is symbolic of peace and humility. So the the reason when we talk about expecting the unexpected, this is already a problem. And I want you to get God's patterns and how God does things. Because so many times we expect God to come through the front door and he'll slip in through the back door. And you've got to be able to identify and have recognition and discernment that even though this has come in a way I was never expecting, this is nonetheless still him. Okay? And so the people are expecting him to be a conquering king. They're expecting him to come on a white horse. They're expecting him to save them. And this is what the people were saying. They were expecting him to come as a deliverer. They were expecting him to overthrow Roman oppression and to turn over a political system. And when you look at what he came to do, he came to seek and save that which was lost, but he was referring to their spirit and to their eternal well-being. So the people misunderstood him. Somebody say they misunderstood him. And they, you know, we don't come down on them for misunderstanding him. When you look at why they thought that Jesus was going to come as this powerful king who was going to overturn and interrupt systems and overthrow a Roman government, this was not a stretch. It wasn't far-fetched. It was actually something that the scriptures, in essence, validated. It was just a wrong perception and a misinterpretation. Uh, When you have the wrong perception, how you see things, then you come out with the wrong perspective. When you have the wrong perspective, then that literally sets the tone for your expectations. If your perception is wrong, your expectations will be wrong. Oh, this is good. I'm helping married couples. I'm helping married couples because 
it's the way you hear things, it's the way you see things, it's the way you feel about things. It is often, and I, I hope I don't get ahead of myself, it is often not how people perceive you. It is more how you perceive that they perceive you. It's good teaching already. So you gotta understand, it doesn't matter what people say or think about you, those are only projections from their own soul. When there's brokenness, when there's pain, when there are trauma wounds, then you're literally viewing life through those lenses and you will begin to see and assess every situation from that angle. It's good. So when you look at the people, let's look at some of these scriptures because number one, Isaiah chapter nine, verses six to seven, and it describes a child who will be born and he'll be a wonderful counselor. He'll be a mighty God. This child is referred to a mighty God. Okay, everlasting father, prince of peace, watch this, and the government will rest on his shoulders, which means he's running it. He's in control. So the people are reading this and it's like, okay, he's about to overthrow this Roman government. It's in the Bible, okay? Then Micah 5, two through five, it says this, it predicts, it's a prophecy, the birth of a ruler in Bethlehem. He's a ruler in Bethlehem, okay? He'll be great to the ends of the earth and he'll bring peace. These were prophetic words and scriptures that the religious leaders of the day study and they knew back and forth. And they're looking at this saying, listen, this guy who has come, the savior, the Messiah, he's gonna be a ruler. He's gonna rule in Bethlehem and he's gonna be great to the ends of the earth and he will bring peace with them, okay? Psalms 2, seven through nine, it speaks of God's anointed, the Messiah, who will rule over the nations and shatter them with a rod of iron. And so when you look at those types of words and those types of prophecies that shaped and molded their perspective to where now they are set to receive when the Messiah comes, he will look like this, okay? But then they didn't pay attention to scriptures like Isaiah 53, three through four, which talked about a suffering servant who would be rejected and despised, bearing the sins of others. They didn't look at Zechariah 9 and 9, which foretells a meek and humble king who will come riding in on a donkey. Then talk about Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 through 26, when it talked about the coming of the Messiah and anointed one, um, and the Pharisees overlooked how it said that the Messiah would be cut off having nothing, but they were expecting this victorious, powerful ruler. You've got to be careful with perceptions and perspectives because it doesn't matter that you are saved. It doesn't matter that you love God. It doesn't matter if you believe in Jesus. Number one, the keys to actually walking in step with the Holy Spirit is having an open heart and an open mind to what the Spirit is doing, okay? Now, when we look at the text, Palm Sunday, Jesus riding in on the donkey, Jesus is approaching Jerusalem and when you look at Matthew chapter 23, he's weeping and he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Um, it says in the count of Luke 19 that he approached and saw the city and he wept over it. And that word wept comes from the same word used in John 11 and 33 when Mary and Martha wept over Lazarus. And so in other words, he was crying out in anguish. He was crying out in anguish, why? Because Israel were the chosen people of God that he had decided he was gonna come through these people. And the time of visitation has come and they have rejected the work of God and what Jesus is actually doing. He says, like a, a, a hen that broods over her young with her wings, he desired to gather the children of God, but they were not willing. He says, and as a result, your house will be left desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So oftentimes Palm Sunday is overshadowed by Resurrection Sunday, but I believe that if we get the meaning of what God is doing in the text, it will set the table for his resurrection, okay? Now, when we look at what Jesus did in his ministry, 
the people, as they were coming, and Jesus was riding on that donkey, they were waving their palm branches. They're waving their palm branches, and they're laying them at his feet, and there's almost this bowing as he's coming, and they're acknowledging him as Savior. They're acknowledging him as Messiah. Now, when you look at this practice of waving this palm branch, it actually takes its biblical roots in the Old Testament under the law. Um, they had different types of offerings and sacrifices that they would give to God. One of those sacrifices was called a wave offering. Somebody say a wave offering. Wave offering was when they would sacrifice the peace offering, they would basically set it up with the oils and the spices. They would sprinkle the blood and do it exactly as God had commanded. But then they would take a portion of it and then they would hold it up to God and then they would wave that sacrifice. And that was called a wave offering. And when you wave that sacrifice, number one, it's a sign of surrenderance, that they're surrendering their sins and their old ways, and now they're being opened up to a new life and restoration with God. Because the offering, the sacrifices, they made penitence on behalf of the people, but it was only a temporary fix. So they had to do it year after year until Jesus would come on the scene and ultimately he would cleanse and redeem us from sin forever. Okay? And so they, they would wave that sacrifice before God. It was a sign of surrenderance. It was homage to God. It was worship to God. And it was just a way that they praised God. You see now um, in the text with the palms, they're doing the same thing. So it is not sacrifices, but they're getting the palm branches, which represent victory. Somebody say victory. They're getting the palm branches and they're waving them before Jesus. So it's also an acknowledgement that he is God, that he is Messiah. Okay, so then they wave them and then they lay them at his feet. And then when you look at us today, that's really where our practice comes from in modern day version. We lift up our hands and we wave them before God. And it's a sign of surrenderance, praise and worship to God. Okay, so Jesus comes in and they worship him. They understand the significance of the event. Listen to me. They understand the significance of the event, but they misunderstand the mission and the mandate. They understand because it's like, okay, Jesus is coming. This is the moment. He's about to free us. He's about to deliver us. He's about to save us, but from what? They have missed it. And so when you break down Jesus' schedule, number one, on Sunday, they, uh, they brought him in. He rode on the donkey. They were shouting Hosanna. That's in Matthew chapter 21. And then later on that day, Jesus visits the temple, which is also in Matthew 21. Jesus visits the temple. And as he's visiting the temple, he literally goes in and the people are mishandling the people of God, and they're cheating them out of money with the sacrifice system, with the turtle doves. They are basically um, getting over on them, and they're charging a higher rate, and they're really prohibiting people from coming in and, coming in and worshiping God. Okay? But it is through manipulation. It is through deception. It is through cheating and dishonesty, right? And so when Jesus sees this, Jesus comes in and Jesus, watch what he does. He flips over the tables. I love that Jesus. Could y'all imagine if I got anger and I just took this and threw it? Y'all would just be like, um, we clearing out, Derek gone. We don't like him no more. We don't like him no more. Yeah, that's what Jesus did. But y'all say y'all love him. It's the same Jesus, okay? Because of what they were doing in the house of God, he flips over the tables and then it gets worse. He grabs a whip. Now listen, let's talk about this. What church, now listen, y'all know they didn't have guns back then. They didn't have guns back then. What church you know that just got whips and guns laying down on the ground? I mean, I, out of nowhere, he grabs his whip and he whips the people out of the temple. Listen, I'm just left to conclude that, listen, Jesus was packing. 
I'm telling y'all, I'm telling y'all, had to be, had to be. Like that was real convenient that out of nowhere, he just has a whip laying around. Come on, Jesus. Jesus grabs the whip. He whips the money changers out of the temple. And watch what he says. He says, my father's house was meant to be a house of prayer for all nations. Somebody say all nations. But you made it a den of thieves. He got upset. He got angry. Listen, it is not a sin to get angry. Oh, y'all are quiet on that one. And half of y'all that's quiet be the ones getting angry. <laughs> it is not a sin to get angry. The Bible says, be ye angry and sin not. Jesus in this moment was angry. But he was angry for the right reasons. He was angry for the right amount of time. And when it was over with, he knew how to let it go. See, the issue with us is you get angry for the wrong reasons. You hold on to it and you don't never let it go. Good teaching. It's it. That's the Bible. And so what Jesus is doing is actually called righteous indignation. Sin should make you angry. You should hate what God hates. The Bible says in Romans 12 and 9, let love be without dissimulation, abhor, abhor. Somebody say abhor. That means hate. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. And so Jesus drives out the, the money changers and he says, listen, you are abusing and you are misusing the purpose of what the house of God was intended for. And let me just throw this out here too. That's not selling books. That's not selling books. That is not selling a product. That's okay. It is the misuse and the abuse of that that becomes the issue. It is cheating the people of God that becomes the problem. That is what this text is about. Okay? So he drives them out. This is on Sunday. And he says, listen, you're abusing God's house. You are cheating the people and you're getting in the way of wor them worshiping God, which is the intention of why it was created. Okay? Now, Monday comes and Jesus returns to the temple. He confronted the religious leaders and he's teaching them about faith and forgiveness through the parable of the fig tree and how it withered away by his words and by his authority. And he begins to teach the people. Jesus emphasized the importance of genuine faith. Somebody say genuine faith. And the hypocrisy of religious leaders. Okay? He's teaching them about genuine faith and the hypocrisy of religious leaders. When you talk about what is hypocrisy, hypocrisy doesn't mean you miss the mark and fall short of the character of Christ. That's just sin, and you may sin here and there, and you repent of it, and you're convicted by it. Hypocrisy is when you preach one thing and you live in a different way. You teach one thing and you live a different way. You go under the umbrella or the title of a Christian, but nothing in your life exemplifies the life of Christ. This is hypocrisy. This is also a lack of integrity. Somebody say integrity. Integrity literally just means the same on the outside as you are on the inside. Okay? Jesus is teaching these things. Literally, Jesus is about to be crucified and they work in him, y'all. They work in hell. Tuesday comes and Jesus continues teaching in the temple, sharing parables um, such as the parable of the tenants and the wedding feast. So he's teaching about end time prophecy and his second coming, okay? He also answered questions posed by the Pharisees and the Sadducees concerning taxes, the resurrection, and the greatest commandment. And Wednesday, we don't get a whole lot of what he did, but we surmise that it was preparation for his crucifixion on Thursday. Thursday, Jesus shared his last supper with his disciples, and he instituted the sacrament of communion and washing his disciples' feet. So he was teaching them about humility. Somebody say humility. Humility and service. Jesus also gave his disciples the new commandment, which was to love God and to love one another with everything that you have. And he also spoke about Peter's denial. Now, when we look at why Jesus was weeping in Matthew 23, I believe Jesus was weeping because he has so labored to teach and prepare the people to be able to identify and receive his coming. 
He loved them. These were God's chosen people, Chris. This is who God had designated and prophesied of to the people. And Jesus came, there are no tricks or gimmicks. Heaven wasn't trying to trip Israel up to get them to miss a moment. Heaven is not trying to trip us up to get us to miss a moment. But when you are callous and when you are cemented in your own ideologies and there is no flexibility in the Holy Ghost, you will miss your time of visitation with the Lord. When you look at what Jesus came to do from the very beginning, one of his first sermons was in Matthew chapter five and it was called the Beatitudes. Somebody say the Beatitudes. Um, it comes from a Latin word, beatitudes, beatus, and it means happy or blessed, okay? Now, when you talk about the beatitudes, it's your attitude, your conduct, and your disposition. Um, really, I believe they're called the beatitudes because it's the way that your attitude ought to be. Really, that's it. Beatitudes are the way that your attitude ought to be. Jesus is really setting the tone and setting the table and he's giving them really their golden nuggets in the spirit because every single beatitude has a reward or a blessing that is attached to it. And really if they would have followed Jesus' instructions and obeyed and heeded his voice, watch this, they would not have missed him. Watch it, we're gonna, we're gonna go through them. If you obey the Beatitudes, you take them to heart, and this becomes your temperament, your attitude, your behavior, your conduct, you cannot miss what God wants to do in your life. When you are missing a move of God, or when you're missing when God is visiting you, trying to get you into something, number one, is gonna always be good. But if you miss it, I'm going to tell you, and this is a hard word, it's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. Let's, t let's talk about why. <clears throat> Matthew 5 and 3, it says this, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Somebody say poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit is when you, when you realize apart from Christ, you're spiritually bankrupt. Except for the finished work of Christ on Calvary, except for justification by faith through grace in God, we have nothing. We have no justification. We have no righteousness. We are still in a sinful state, separated from God. But because the Lord is compassionate, that's the only reason why we have anything spiritually. So what is that really connected to? Poor in spirit is humility. Somebody say humility. So he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's teaching the people how to stay low. He's teaching them to get away from pride, get away from haughtiness, get away from arrogance, get away from a proud look, get away from thinking that you are more than what you are, get away from being exalted in yourself. And he's teaching them how to be completely reliant and dependent on God where you empty yourself out and you say, God, I need you. God, I need you for my next breath. God, I need you to preach this sermon. God, I need you to be a good husband. God, I need you to be a good father. God, it's in you that I live, move, and have my being like a deer that pants by the water. My soul yearns for you. This is what he's teaching the people. He says, listen, you got to get in that type of posture. He's, he's trying to position them to see what God is doing. Okay? He says, bless all the poor in spirit. Somebody say poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then he says in verse four, blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Okay, so mourning is, this is not speaking of like when you lose a family member and you're just constantly in mourning. Again, this is talking about brokenness. It is talking about contrition. It is talking about lowliness. This should be your disposition where your heart should be tender towards the Lord. When was the last time in prayer you were brought to tears. And I'm not talking about because people was lying on you. <laughs> I'm not talking about because you just lost a family member and you were pouring your heart out to God. Anybody can cry like that. I'm talking about when there was nothing wrong other than the fact that you love Jesus. 
You were brought to brokenness. Somebody say brokenness. He says, blessed are they that mourn. Verse five, he said, blessed are the meek, for the meek shall inherit the earth. When it says they shall inherit the earth, it is speaking to favor. Somebody say favor. He says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under constraint. Meekness is like a wild stallion that is bucking and it is, it is out of control, but then it is broken to where it can be ridden. That's meekness, okay? He says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. A lot of times people say, Pastor, what's the key to a deeper relationship with God? How do I go deeper with intimacy in the Holy Spirit? It's just spiritual hunger. That's it. Bible says if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, he promises that he will fill you. Somebody say he'll fill you. And somebody said, well, I just don't feel like praying. I don't feel like reading. I don't feel, I'm, I'm, how do you get hungry? Because I'm not hungry. If you're not spiritually hungry, it's just like in the natural. If you're not hungry in the natural, it can only mean one of two things. If you're not hungry, it means you're sick. So you got to get to the root of that. If you're not hungry in the natural and you have no appetite, that means you're sick. Or it means that you're filled with other things. It's only one of two. So if you're spiritually not hungry and you don't want to eat, what is eating? Eating the word, praying, spending time with God, that means you're sick or you're eating at the wrong table and now you're full. Okay. So he says, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you'll be filled. Sometimes people say, strike while the iron is hot. And that's a good, that's a good saying. But for this, this is the right saying. Start striking the iron and you'll make it hot. So you don't have to always feel it. Sometimes you got to will it. Somebody say, you got to will it. And then God will come. There's a promise attached to this. Okay. He says, blessed are the merciful. Somebody say merciful for they shall obtain mercy. When you look at mercy, the more mercy you give, the more mercy you'll receive. When you got somebody who is judgmental and condemning and they're always trying to find somebody in a fault, listen, this is my goal right here. My goal is to give as much mercy as I possibly can. And really this is just basic love. This is just a believer because the more mercy you extend, number one, it comes from a pure heart when it's done that way because you see things innocently. Love, it assumes innocence. Okay, I'm, I'm back to the relationship, people. I'm helping y'all in your marriages. Love assumes innocence. Love doesn't say, oh, well, they did that because of that. If it's negative, that's only a projection of your own heart. Because if it was love, we'll get to it. If it was love, you would see it through purity, okay? But when you give mercy, you'll obtain mercy. When you got somebody who is high and mighty and they're always um, elevating themselves as if they're untouchable or if they never sinned or if they never done anything wrong, the moment they sin, they're gonna judge that person harshly versus if that person was meek and humble and always giving other people mercy, you need to give as much mercy as possible because your day is coming. Your day is coming where you're going to need mercy. Somebody say, I need mercy. Okay, now it says, blessed are the pure in heart. This is it, for they shall see God. Now this is one key to seeing in the spirit is the posture of your heart. A pure heart can see God, okay? But the other thing is this, is speaking to eternity, God expects purity and sanctification. But then the other thing is this, which is what we've been skipping and sliding through. When people accuse you falsely and they bring up accusations and it's negative and they're lying on you, anybody ever been lied on before? Okay, two of y'all. I see you, Ashlyn. When people lie on you and they manipulate and they accuse you and they speak all manner of evil against you, that is only telling that they are doing that because they have wicked and evil hearts. Listen, 
the Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This means that when your heart is pure and turned towards the Lord, in any situation, you will see God. Good teaching. You'll see God. You won't see the negative. You won't feed into the negative. You will only see God because my heart is pure. So it is a projection. And this deals with your perception, your perspective, and your expectation. It says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Then it says, blessed are the peacemakers. Somebody say peacemakers. Now you want some peacemakers on your team. You want to be around some peacemakers because when there's no peace, they'll make peace. <laughs> When there is no peace, these people will go out of their way to make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Children of God live in peace. Peace is not an experience. The Bible says in Colossians 3 and 15, and let the peace of God rule in your heart. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So peace was not ever meant to be an experience for the believer. Peace is the place that I live. So I live in peace and I make peace. Somebody say, I make peace. I'm a peacemaker. That's a sign that you are a child of God, okay? Then it says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then it says this, blessed are you when people insult you, when people persecute you falsely, when they say all manner of evil against you because of me, rejoice and be glad because your, your reward is great in heaven. Now we got to get this. It says bless. Somebody say bless. Now we all want to be blessed, but we don't want to be blessed like this. Verse 11 and 12, y'all don't want them kind of blessings. We all want to be blessed, but watch what it says a blessing is. It's a blessing when people insult you. It's a blessing when people persecute you. And when they falsely accuse you, and when men say all manner of evil against you falsely, he says, you're blessed. Somebody say, I'm blessed. Why are you blessed? Because you are not worthy to be named in Christ's sufferings. Bible says when the apostles were getting persecuted, and when I say persecuted, I'm not talking about they lied on them. We can't take nobody lying on us, y'all. He says the apostles, they were threatening their life to boil them in pots of oil, to behead them. And the Bible says that they went away shouting and rejoicing because they said that our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Perspective, perception, expectation. Jesus said, as I've suffered in the flesh, arm yourself likewise. He says, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. Why are they going to hate you? Because you are children of the light and you're exposing the kingdom of darkness. The Bible says that men love darkness rather than the light. So if your light is shining, you are stirring up and you are aggravating people's demons. You don't have to do anything but represent God. And as a result of you shining that light, they're going to hate you. If you are not being hated, you're not doing something right. The expectation is there because Jesus prepared us. Jesus spoke this to us. Okay? So he gives these teachings of the Beatitudes very early in the ministry. And Jesus basically telling them, this is how... Your attitude, your conduct, and your behavior should be. And as a result of this, he says, this will cause you to grow and flourish as a Christian. This will be a spiritual roadmap to spiritual growth and development. Okay? So if you keep all of these beatitudes and you walk them out, really the focus of them, their virtues like humility, mercy, righteousness, peacemaking. If you walk these qualities out, you cannot miss what God wants to do in your life. You can't. 
You can't. Not only can we not miss it in our life, but we cannot miss it in this church. You can't. Okay? Watch this. Because so oftentimes, and I, I preach this, we believe, and this is a lazy way of thinking, and I used to think this way. We, be, we believe that, well, what God has for me is for me. We used to sing a song called, what God has for me is for me, and we would be rocking, choir would be jamming. We used to sing, what God has for me is for me, and they break it up, tenor, alto, and soprano, and somebody say, it is for me, and I would just be like waving my hands, giving God a wave offering. Y'all better stop singing them songs. It sounds spiritual, it sounds holy, it sounds righteous, but it's a lie. It's just a lie. There's no way. It's easy to do that because then that takes responsibility and accountability off of us. That, oh, if God wants to be blessed, I'm just going to be blessed. If God wants me healed, I'm just going to be healed. If God wants my marriage restored, then he's just going to restore it. No, God wants your marriage restored, period. There's no if. He already said it in his word. He wants your marriage restored and unified to be an example to the world of the bride of Christ. There's no if. What are you talking about if? These are the promises that God has for you, but you're going to have to get active and involved in your own deliverance. What are you saying, Pastor? This is what I'm saying. There are many things that God has for us that we're just going to miss. Some of it because of ignorance. Some of it because we're blind and we cannot see. Some of it because you're inflexible. Some of it because you are grounded in your theologies and your traditions. Some of it because it has been this way for such a long time and we don't want to deviate from where it was. You're going to miss it. Period. And it doesn't mean that God did not have it for you. You just can't see it. Well, I, well that wasn't my experience. I, I never experienced that. No, I've been saved for 40 years. You think you've experienced everything that God has? That's arrogance. That is diabolically opposed to Jesus' teachings. Watch this. And that was the problem in the text. That was the only problem in the text. Well, well, are you saying I'm bad? No, I'm not saying you're bad. These were God's chosen people. And he wept in anguish because they missed it. Somebody say they missed it. Let us not miss it. Let us not miss it. Israel still doesn't know that Jesus has come. Okay? Now watch this. You look at this, here's an example, rich young ruler, Matthew chapter 19. Rich young ruler, he goes to Jesus. I'm gonna read this from the message, Matthew 19, verse 16. It says, one day a man came to Jesus asking, teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, well, why do you question me about what's good? God is the one who is good. If you wanna enter the life of God, just do what he tells you to do. Pretty simple. The man asks, well, what in particular? The man is a good man. His head is in the right place. His heart is in the right place. He's hungry. He wants eternal life. He's asking all the right questions. And he says, listen, well, what? The man says, well, what do I have to do specifically? Jesus said, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, honor your father and your mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. Somebody say, love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said, well, I've done all of that. He said, what's left? Watch this. He says, sell all of your possessions and give them to the poor. All of your wealth will then be in heaven. Then, come and follow me. Now watch this, here's the deal. I've been telling y'all this a long time. We are in a westernized, watered down type of theology, but the truth is, Jesus was setting the tone for the New Testament church and for believers. He's telling you, and he modeled this with all of his disciples, hey, to follow me, you really will have to give up everything. 
So he's telling them, sell everything that you have. And, and you, may, you may say, well, is God asking me to sell all my possessions and give them to the poor? He might. He might. And if he does, assess your heart, would you be willing to do it like that? Because number one, delayed obedience is disobedience. It's a heart posture. God is not necessarily making this a, a requirement or prerequisite to follow him, but he needs to know that I got your heart above anything else. If I asked for it, you'd be willing to get it, give it up and separate from it, okay? Watch what happens and watch the reason why it happened. He said, sell all your possessions to the poor and then come and follow me. Watch this, here it is, here's the key. That was the last thing that that young man expected to hear. Somebody say, change your expectation. That was the last thing. It caught him off guard. It took him by surprise. It was unexpected. Watch this. It was the last thing he expected to hear. And so sorrowfully, he walked away. He was holding, watch this, he was holding on tight to a lot of things and he couldn't bear to let them go. He's face to face with God. He's face to face with Jesus. And this is his defining moment. This is the moment that will change his entire life. But he missed it. He missed that moment because he wasn't expecting for God to come in that way. He wasn't a bad guy. He, lo he loved God. He was born and raised in church. He kept the laws. He was moral. He was clean. He was ethical. But there was a heart issue. When God told him what I'm requiring of you, he wasn't willing to part ways with it. This also happened in Exodus chapter 14, verses 10, really that whole chapter. And God had promised the children of Israel multiple times, I'm gonna bring you into a land of promise. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. You won't have any needs for anything. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. Joshua and Caleb gathered up 12 spies, watch this, and they go to the promised land for 40 days. Somebody say 40 days. They go for 40 days to spy out the land, to collect data. They, they want to know what they're up against. But God had already told them, you'll overtake them and that's your land. God had already given them a promise. I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring you into a land that flows with milk and honey. This was the promise to the people of God. Watch this. Once they saw the challenges with the land, then they got discouraged and they got in fear. Why? Because they were not expecting those roadblocks or those challenges to be there. Who cares what challenges are there if God said, this is your land, this is your land, and that's where he's taking you. This is God's land. God's just saying, trust me. Somebody say, trust him. I don't have to know what he's doing. It doesn't have to look like what I thought it should look like. It doesn't have to meet my terms and on my conditions. If God said this is mine, I believe you, I trust you, God, and I'm walking in step with your spirit. <laughs> Woo! Okay, so what ends up happening, the 12 spies come back, they deliver the message to Israel. This is so good, I get excited. I wish I could just park here and just lay here in this text. They get so excited. They come back and Patty with the 12 spies, only two had a positive report. Joshua and Caleb, they said, listen, they started speaking. They was talking ghetto. They said, we be able. Somebody say, we be able. That's in King James, y'all. They said, we be able to overtake them. They got, it got good to them. They said, we be able. Somebody say, we be able. Somebody say, I can do it. They said, we be able to overtake them. But the other 10 came back with a negative report and basically it was like, yo, we can't do it. There are giants in the land. It, it's, it's not what we thought it was gonna be. We look like grasshoppers in comparison to the giants over there, okay? Now, Israel had a tendency to get like this, where they would begin to murmur and complain, where they wouldn't believe God. 
these, these are people who God said, they're my people, but God said, these are hard headed, stiff neck people. God told, I mean, God was like joning on them. Y'all know they used to talk about each other, talk about each other, mamas and stuff. He said, he said, listen, these are hard headed, stiff neck people. They're my people, but they're tough. They have some issues. He said, listen, when you look at these people, every time God would deliver them or bring them out, they would go right back into complaining and fear and doubt and unbelief. At the most extreme exploits and manifestations of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about a whole sea splitting and walking across. And I was looking at something where it said the Red Sea, the tide is so low you can walk across. This is what an atheist was saying. It was like the tide is so low you can walk across t twice a year anyway. And it was an aerial view and you can literally see a path going through it. And they said, that's not a miracle. This is, they said, that's why Christians are dumb because they believe stuff like that. I'm like, okay, so if it really was that time of year where they just so happened to get where the tide was low, then how did Pharaoh and his army drive in ankle deep water? How'd they drown? <laughs> Atheists don't, listen, I'm just telling you. How did, the, how did Pharaoh and his army drown in ankle deep water? It's a miracle somewhere. <laughs> so we look at it. And the people, Israel, they would always be like this, indecisive, unstable, double-minded, always going back on what God, they would say, oh yeah, we want the move of God, but when it looks at getting through the process, no, we don't want it, let us go back to Egypt. It was just instability and chaos. Well, God had got tired of it. God got tired of it quite a few times. One time the earth opened up and just swallowed up the people. Okay, one time, they were complaining and murmuring. Snakes came and bit them and ate them up and they died. But this time, God was like, done, done. Somebody say, done, done. <laughs> when you say it twice, you're serious. God said, listen, okay, y'all are not going. Y'all are not going. Listen, I'm pronouncing a judgment and you're not going. Because every time you complain, you murmur, you allow fear to overtake you, you speak against your leadership, y'all are not going. Y'all will not go. Like I guarantee you, you are not going into the promised land. Okay? Now he says this because of the complaining. For 40 days, surely, for 40 days they collected data and for those 40 days they murmured and complained against the report of the Lord. Okay? And God said, okay, here it is. I'm about to drop it. Here it is. He says, for every day that you complain, you're gonna be held back one year. Mm -hmm. That's deep. He says, for every day you murmured, you complained, you got in fear, you spoke negativity, you spoke against the word of God, you spoke against what God is doing, for every day you complain, you'll be held back in the wilderness for a year, which meant that they were wandering around the wilderness aimlessly for 40 years. For 40 years, what was only a few days journey, they got held back for 40 years. Now, I wanna say this, and this is good news. If that is true, I believe that the opposite of that is true. I believe for every day that you speak the promises of God and that you agree with the word of God, I believe it can cause you to live in one year of blessings. I believe that. I believe if you agree with God, you speak what heaven is speaking, you get up and you open up your Bible and you just walk out the promises of God, you have an assurity and a faith and you know that this is what God says, I believe you can live in a year of blessing for every day you speak positive. Okay? And so you see the children of Israel, they miss the promised land and I don't have time because I gotta wrap it up, but there are multiple times where God promises them that this is their land, yet they did not see it. Now, God didn't lie. It still ended up being Israel's land. Just that generation didn't get to see it. You see what I'm saying? God had it for them. God promised it to them. But he ain't just going to do it. You got to cooperate with heaven. You got to get in alignment with what God is doing. And so 
I believe this is what caused Jesus this heartache when he's seeing the people worshiping him and when he's seeing the people bowing down and I'm closing, the uh, musicians can come. He also gives these woes to the Pharisees. And these woes are found in Matthew 23. They're just two chapters after they shouted Hosanna. So this would still be the week of his crucifixion. This is still the week of his crucifixion. And the Pharisees were the religious leaders. They knew the law, they knew the word, but they were hypocrites. Somebody say hypocrites. Matthew 13, 23 and 13. He says, but woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. For you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering in to go in. So he's saying, listen, you're the religious leaders, but you're blocking people from getting to me. Verse 14, he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, and for pretense you make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. So he's saying, listen, you're doing it for pretense. You're doing it to be seen. You're doing it religiously. He says in verse 15, he says, woe unto you. Somebody say, woe unto you. He says, you religion scholars and Pharisees, frauds, you go halfway around the world to make a new convert. But once you get them in, you make him into a replica of yourselves. <laughs> he says it's twice as much a son of hell as you are Jesus was going in these were the religious leaders who knew the word who knew the law but he said it's all religion it's all traditions it's all pretenses it's devoid of a relationship with me he says and then you make new believers and then you just sit here and make them like you he says and they're twice as worse as what you are Jesus' teachings. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He says, you hopeless religion scholars, frauds. You make a tic meticulous account books, watch this, tithing on every nickel and dime you get. But on the meat of God's law, what is meat? The substance, what's important? He says, things like fairness, somebody say fairness. Things like compassion and commitment, the absolute basics. You carelessly take it or leave it. Careful bookkeeping is commendable. So he's saying, listen, it's not wrong to tithe. It's not wrong to do these things. They're important. He says, but the basics are required. He says, do you have any idea how silly you look? Writing a life story that's wrong from start to finish. Jesus was on one nitpicking over commas and semicolons. He says, woe to you, verse 25, scribes and Pharisees, you buff the surface of your cups and bowls so they sparkle in the sun while the insides are maggoty with your greed and gluttony. Message verses, stupid Pharisee, scour the insides and then the gleaming surface will mean something then it'll mean something Jesus is saying listen you're doing all of these things you're going through religious motions you're cleaning the outside of your cup but you have left off the weightier matters He's saying the things that are important, the things that are of substance, the things that hold eternal weight and value, your heart is not cleaned. Verse 27, he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but on the inside they're full of dead men's bones. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build tombs of the prophets. He says, you build granite tombs for your prophets and marble monuments for your saints. 
And you say that if you had lived in the days of your ancestors, here's the arrogance, no blood would have been on your hands. You protest too much. You're cut from the same cloth as those murderers. And daily you add to the death count. Wow. He's saying, listen, your heart posture is wrong. He's saying, you're doing the things on the outside and you're going through the religious motions. He says, but I'm not as concerned about the outside as I'm concerned about the inside. He said, listen, clean your heart. He says, lay it before God. Examine your motives. Examine your ways. And ask God to come in your life and to fill you with his very presence. Now, here's the deal. This is what brought Jesus great sorrow. This is what brought Jesus great pain. And I don't just think this brought Jesus sorrow and great pain. 2,000 years ago, I think it still brings Jesus great sorrow and pain when he sees this amongst his church. When he sees his children, and you can examine your life in your own way, in your day-to-day -day living, of how he wants to visit you of how he wants to see you, of how he has good plans for you, of how he has a purpose for you, but your eyes are dimmed, your heart is shut, and you cannot see and you are not able to discern that it is Jesus knocking at your door. Now, I don't know about you, but my prayer is, God, whatever it is, whatever you have for me, whatever you want to do in my life, Lord, I am ready to receive it. Uh, open up my heart so that I can understand it. Let every veil be lifted. Come on. Let every veil be torn in the name of Jesus. Uh, come on, somebody say, let it be torn that Father, I want you more than anything else. I want you more than my preferences. I want you more than my traditions. I want you more than my ways. And if there are areas that are darkened, if there are areas that I'm oblivious to, Father, expose them and reveal it to me now because I want to please God. God, I don't want to miss anything you're doing. I don't want to miss anything that you're doing in my life. Lord, I want to seek your face. And Father, in this season, I am trusting in you with all of my heart, uh, and I am not leaning to my own understanding. Father, we are acknowledging you in every way. And Father, our desire is for you to direct our path. Does anybody believe that? Is that anybody's prayer? That you God, want God to mold you, you want God to shape you, you want God to fix your eyes on him. Hallelujah, everybody standing up on your feet. Lord, fix our eyes on you. Show us the way to your heart. Show us what your will is for our life. Show us the path that you would have for us to take. Anything that's not of you, let it be broken now in the name of Jesus. Let every veil be lifted in Jesus' name. Open up our eyes so that we might see, oh God, and open up our ears that we might hear. Jesus said to Israel, he said, listen, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we literally see in the book of Revelation, chapter seven, verses nine through 12, he says this, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the lamb, that's Jesus. They were wearing white, ro white robes and were holding palm branches. They get a do-over. They were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches, the sign of victory. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, Hosanna. Somebody say Hosanna. 
all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Somebody shout amen. Somebody give God some praise. Well, oh, I'm excited. I'm excited about what God is doing in this house. I'm excited what God is doing in this church. I'm excited what God is doing in this place, in your life. But I'm telling you, it's a word of warning and caution. You gotta open up your eyes and see. You gotta open up your eyes and see. And you've got to let go of what you've been holding on tightly. It's for every person in this house. If you don't, the pattern is you miss it and there is desolation. And that is a warning. You miss it, there will be desolation as a result. Open up your heart, open up your understanding. And God, whatever you want to do in my life and in this house, we are open to your presence. We are open to your spirit and we're open to you having your way. However that is, God, we just want you. That has to be the heart posture. And if you do it that way, watch God come in and watch his presence rest in this house like we've never seen before. Every head bow, every eye closed. Just wanna to talk to a group of people right now. You're in this place and you're saying, God, I acknowledge you as savior. I don't wanna miss the moment. I don't wanna celebrate the event and confuse the messenger. Jesus, I understand who you are and I want to receive you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my life. Today, I'm asking you to save me. I believe that you are the Son of God and that God has raised you from the dead. Jesus, I can't do this thing without you anymore. I want you to come into my heart. If that's you and you're in here, just let me see your hand. Nobody's looking but me. Nobody's gonna judge you. We're just gonna celebrate you. I see that hand. God bless you. Hallelujah. You're saying, I wanna give my heart to Jesus. I've, I've never given my heart to Jesus. I don't wanna just come to church, leave the same way, but I wanna invite Jesus into my life. If you're in here and you're saying, I wanna be saved, let me see your hand. Don't be ashamed. Thank you, Lord. There's another group of people, maybe you're saved. Maybe you've given your heart to Jesus, but you wanna rededicate your life to him. I've gotten away from the things of God and I wanna recovenant, I wanna recommit. If you're in here and you wanna rededicate your heart to Jesus, let me see your hand. I see your hand, brother. I see your hand, sister. God bless you. All right, I'm just gonna say a prayer and I'm gonna ask you to put some feet on your faith. If you're in here and you raise your hand because you wanna give your heart to Jesus or you wanna rededicate your life, this is your moment. I want you to step out boldly and come down the aisle. Don't care about what people are thinking. Don't care about what people are saying. It's just me and Jesus. There's an audience of one. But as you come down, we're going to celebrate you. And so I'm going to say a prayer. And if you need prayer for anything else, breakthrough, healing, deliverance, agreement, I want you to come down as well. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your power. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for speaking to this house. And Father, I pray right now for every hand that went up that you would give them the faith, the boldness, and the courage to step out into the aisle and that they would put feet on their faith. We rebuke fear now, oh God, and we release faith in this house. In Jesus' name, amen. If that was you, come down now. They're coming. Let's just celebrate them. Let's celebrate them. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. Come on, the angels in heaven rejoice over one. Bless you. 
Woo, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. Never gets old, never gets tired. If your hand went up or if your hand didn't go up and you desire to come, you can come now, even as we're dismissing. Again, join us immediately following service. We're gonna have a fellowship meal. And so I just wanna pray and dismiss. And we're just believing God that this is gonna be a great week, one of the greatest weeks of your life. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. We love you, we adore you. We thank you for your presence. Somebody celebrate Jesus one more time. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your anointing. And I pray, God, that you will bless the food that we're about to partake of. Let it provide nourishment for our bodies. Remove all offense, if there be any, in Jesus' name. As we leave this place, but not your presence, bring us back at your appointed time. We'll be careful to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you. Expect the unexpected. That was such an, another awesome word from there. The Holy Spirit has really blessed him with the message today. I think that, you know, you look at the, uh, is the Jewish people. They prayed for years to give him the Messiah. Right. And they even called him Messiah. They, called, they said, Hosanna, Hosanna, Savior. They praise the Lord. But with, when they didn't like the way he came, they rejected him. And so not understanding that the blessing had come, the prayers had been answered, not in the way that they expected. And Jesus ended up being the savior for everyone. And so I think a lot of times in our life, whenever we pray, we don't like the way that God answers our prayer. But we have to understand that God is all knowing, he's all powerful, and we know he's doing it for our good. And so we just have to be patient, understand, that whatever happens, we always, first of all, praise the Lord, praise Jesus, praise His name, and that God is going to do what He says He's going to do. So regardless of the situation, we know that God's Word will come to pass. He will hear our prayer. He will give you healing. He will give you peace. He always does. He always he does. will. Yes, He does. Yeah. And so also, uh, you know, one of the things we didn't mention earlier was uh, prayer. Right. In the morning, we uh, pray every morning, starting at uh, 6.30 to 8.30 in the morning. And that's a very uh, edifying time for us when we come and we bless the house, we bless one another. Uh, but if you, can't, if you can't make it in the morning, pray your home, bless your home, give thanks to the Lord. When you, when you get up, do what the Word says, seek face the kingdom, seek first the kingdom of God. God. Seek God's face and everything else will be given unto you. So remember that. Right. And uh, any other... Uh, well, we do have Monday night from 6 to 7 p.m. also um, for for prayer, which is very nice. And then, of course, on Wednesday, we will also be doing um, Bible study. And there's intercessory prayer on, from 6.30 to 8 o'clock also with Landra Olson. Right. So. And like I said, it's a very powerful time. Yes. It's a time to just refresh our spirit. I know that when I come... The Holy Spirit just continue and continuously refreshes me, yes. and He reminds me that He's always with me, and He and He acknowledges all the things that He's been doing in my life, the things that I've been praying for for the church, for our country, for people all over the world. It's amazing to see our 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 prayers come to pass on how God answers them yep. in ways that sometimes we don't expect. Exactly what Derek said, yes. but ultimately, it's all about our heart. Uh, it's about having a pure heart so we can see God. And when we see God, we try to follow what he does and be like him, to be like Jesus. So thank you once again for joining us today. We pray blessings over everyone. I speak the name yes. of Jesus over everyone for every situation in your life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.